we are going to follow uh, the same system as yesterday. Three speakers, they are going to talk for 10 minutes and then we will have speakers, five other speakers who come or who are members of uh, political parties, trade unions or social movements. The, I'm going to introduce to you the three speakers. To my right, Maria Canamessini. She comes from Greece. She is professor at the Pantheon University. She's a feminist. She's very active in the Greek and European movements because she works a lot on European policies. To my left, Juan Josep Nuet, I'm not going to introduce him to you because you know him, you know him better than me. And then Rosa Martinez, who's a spokes, uh, the spokesperson for the Green Party. She has studied uh, political sciences. So let's get started first, Maria, and then I'm going to introduce to you the five other speakers. I'm going to ask to you, because the vast majority of you, of people here are Spanish or Catalan people, the movement they represent here are written in Spanish, and I'm going to introduce our speakers and the speakers are going to tell you the movements they belong to, the organizations they belong to, because it will be easier this way. So, Maria. You Democracy is also about the power of the people to exercise control and shape the political decisions that determine their present and their future through participatory processes and institutions at all levels. Democracy nowadays is under attack, under attack in Europe. However, the transformation of parliamentary democracies into oligarchical parliamentary regimes is underway for at least three decades. Democracy has been shrinking uh, about, excuse me, about, uh, no, along with the rise of neoliberalism, that is after the defeat of the radical left and uh, the social movements of the 70s, um, and after the socialist and social democratic parties had uh, ended, um, excuse me, had endorsed liberalism uh, and uh, transform themselves in social liberal parties. Excuse me. In the south of Europe, the socialist parties acceded to power in the 80s and ended up with privatizations, corruption and scandals after having extended workers' rights and um, developed the welfare state in the first phase of their mandate. The European Integration Project, initiated by, by the European Single Act of 1986 and then by the Maastricht Treaty in the beginning of the 90s, marked the end, the official end of the social democratic contract and, and uh, the European integration played an important role in the retreat of democracy over the European continent. European integration was not only about building uh, the EU, the EU institutional architecture and policies um, on the basis of monetaristic and neoliberal principles. It also entailed a huge operation of diminishing national sovereignty and therefore the, so the scope for popular sovereignty uh, through an increasing delegation of power for rule and policy making from national governments and parliaments to European intergovernmental uh, institutions and bureaucracies. Uh, the European left has 
um, exclu has extensively analyzed the democratic deficit of the EU, uh, mostly by uh, criticizing the weak role of the European Parliament. Uh, my opinion is that we should uh, enlarge this debate uh, in order to be able to present an al a democratic alternative for Europe. I mean by this that we should rethink how a democratic Europe should look like and uh, relaunch the debates that were very they were prevalent uh, in the anti-Maastricht movement in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, we, uh, the, these debates were uh, looking at how democracy should be implemented uh, in uh, the European Union. Uh, I, rem I remind you the debate on the federal uh, versus integrated form of Europe. Of Europe. Uh, during these three decades of neoliberalism, at the national level, uh, the, polit the uh, political uh, yeah, uh, power became more dependent on economic power and more infiltrated by the interests of big capital. The, big, uh, the mass media became the most powerful instruments for shaping public opinion uh, and uh, were, became crucial for gaining elections. The role of political parties in spreading ideas and organized the masses diminished uh, greatly. Uh, at the same time, a bipartisan political system was created in which both parties, alternating in power, served faithfully the interests of capital and especially the interests of financial and multinational capital everywhere in Europe. Syriza in Greece keeps saying that he is committed to break the triangular relations between political parties, the economic oligarchy and banks. He has presented to the Greek people a series of measures concerning the finances of political parties, the operation of the mass media, and the institutional framework for public procurement, which was the basis for this uh, interrelationship between the big capital and the state. We know very well that the crisis and austerity have been an opportunity for neoliberal forces in Europe to complete their project. In, U in the EU, the new fiscal compact, the European semester, the two PAC uh, directives, the Euro Plus Pact have uh, recently imposed a much more restrictive regime of central surveillance uh, and control on the economic policy of the member states. Legal restrictions have been reinforced, further limiting the realm of democratic control of economic policy. Uh, austerity goes hand in hand with uh, measures uh, with the removal uh, from, nation, uh, from the national governments and, power, and parliaments of the power to decide on uh, fiscal policy. Uh, however, democracy received a more important blow in the countries of southern Europe, not only because of the um, harshness of austerity, but also because of the implementation of uh, policies and measures of internal devaluation uh, meant to restore competitiveness and um, correct external imbalances, imbalances in the current accounts, um, uh, in current accounts. Uh, the, the way was through, through uh, cutting labor costs. In Greece, Portugal and Spain, um, we, we have seen a drastic retrenchment of labor and social rights. Um, unprecedented uh, retrenchment of these rights. The Troika itself uh, was found Ill illegitimate uh, as, um, by um, transgressing the European law by European Parliamentary uh, Commission. Uh, I will give you some examples of how democracy has been hurt in Greece by austerity and with this I will close my intervention. Uh, in Greece, uh, uh, the power of parliament has been uh, severely, drastically uh, weakened during the austerity period. Uh, let me tell you that uh, the memoranda of understanding that have the two memoranda that have been implemented in Greece pass through parliament with, uh, 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 under a single article of law. Um, 
300 pages of commitments of the, of the, of the Greek state towards the lenders and the, Europe, the IMF, the EU, and the EU, and the e European Central Bank passed by Parliament through a single article voted by the Parliament. And numerous other implementation laws of this memorandum have passed in the same way through Parliament. Uh, at the same time, we have had many laws passed not through Parliament, but through ministerial council decisions and presidential decrees. Uh, whoever knows the history of the Nazi party during the, uh, the, the, the interwar period, uh, uh, the, uh, we, you may remember from Germany that the presidential decrees and the, the use of presidential decrees and the weakening of the parliament was the pre, um, the, 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 uh, was identified with the rise of Nazism uh, in, in, in the interwar period. Uh, this is very important. Um, um, so, um, uh, moreover, the government has repeatedly ignored decisions by high courts. The high courts decide and the government does not implement the decisions of the high courts. Uh, the government ha has also proceeded to repression of empl uh, to the requisition employees on strike. Uh, it has closed down the public broadcasting po company without even passing the law, the respective law through parliament. Until now, we don't have the law, we, we, haven't, uh, we don't have the law that uh, abolishes the public broadcasting uh, uh, company. The people have been fired, but the law has not been passed and the, the broadcasting company has been closed down. Um, last but not least, uh, uh, the, 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 the Mr. Samaras and his close collaborators have uh, intentionally tolerated and, and thus um, uh, enabled the, rises, the rise of Nazi extremism in Greece. As you very know, well know, uh, the Golden Dawn has been uh, now, uh, is now a, a party uh, whose leaders are in prison, but still uh, uh, receive 6% of the, of the, of the polls, uh, in the polls uh, for the, Europe, for the uh, national elections. Last, uh, so, uh, Syriza's victory, uh, we hope that will bring democracy back to our countries. Uh, we mean by that, uh, that we count on people's, not only on people's vote, but also on people's readiness and mobilization during the negotiations with Greece's lenders and the representatives of EU and IMF uh, and the IMF. We also mean by bringing democracy back that we have committed ourselves in creating participative bodies and institutions for the implementation of our program. This is what we call democratic planning at all levels, and we, are, we have uh, uh, forcibly argued for a, um, a directive, but also democratic state. Thank you. Good morning. This forum is very ambitious because we are dealing with different topics and if we had to make proposals on all the topics we could spend hours here so i'm going to give you like small ideas on issues i think are important and then i think with uh, other speakers uh, we'll hear about other ideas on democracy i think that the key when we talk about democracy is that all political debates in order to find a solution to big problems, all debates have to tackle democracy. We have to have a safe democracy. And what do I mean by this? Well, I mean that democracy become the key element to provide answers. We have talked about new social and political agreement. We need a new social and political agreement in which democracy will be the key element. Either we talk about economic crisis, or financial crisis, the solution goes through democracy. Uh, we can start with companies. If we talk about political crisis, 
Well, the solution, apart from the political crisis, well, the solution is more democracy, not less democracy. More democracy, more participation. And in Catalonia, of course, we have a national crisis here uh, concerning the um, national organization. Well, the answer, again, is more democracy. So democracy is the key element. Second remark, uh, human rights and immigration. Well, immigration is something we cannot stop. Why? We have one billion people live with every day with less than one euro. How can we tell one billion people, which are one billion different lives, hundreds of thousands of families that are unemployed, that cannot eat, that have no hope. How can we tell them that we have to live, they have to live like this? This is impossible. So when we debate about uh, um, for or against immigration, we have to take into account that we have been imposed certain policies and that there is a growing inequality. So people want to have a better life and people look for this better life some in other parts of the world. So this is the debate, the growing inequality that is going to carry on in the future. And that will make that we have more and more immigrants moving around the world. And we cannot support an economic policy fostering this inequality model and say at the same time that immigrants are a problem and that we have to control borders because immigrants are coming here and they become a problem for our society. So we cannot do this. And this is what the right uh, wing parties do. The third remark, xenophobia, like um, the racist debate. There is an, a political component. They need, this party needs a global enemy. Before it, it was the Soviets. The Soviet Union doesn't est exist anymore. They need a global enemy to justify, for instance, a military investment all the military sector that needs a global enemy. And if this enemy doesn't exist, they can invent one. They need this global enemy to pass restrictive uh, laws on uh, liberty, on freedom. If there is a fear, people are more willing to um, accept certain laws because they think there are terrorists that are going to attack our families. Bin Laden was born or appeared uh, because he was supporting CIA during the Afghanistan war. And we know that Al-Qaeda at the beginning had the support. and. We know that today in Turkey and in other countries, CIA people are training uh, the Syrian opposition. They are in par part of the problem. So this global enemy serves several purposes. So we, uh, left people, are asked if, whether we are with terrorists or with security. Uh, when we say that we need less uh, investment in mi the military uh, sector, then we are blamed that um, we don't support the victims of this uh, global war. I'm not saying that there are no problems, but the Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria invasions, or the war uh, in Libya or in Syria have created millions of terrorists because there has been an in prior investment in these uh, conflicts. So this is the problem. And the free trade agreement. First of all, we want to know what they are negotiating, because what they are negotiating are 
our labor rights, our food security, and very important things. We want to know what Europe is negotiating with the states. We have to rem remember that the TTIP and other treaties come from other treaties, and that the free trade agreements, for instance, the one the US has have with Mexico after uh, its implementation hasn't created new uh, jobs. Quite the contrary, has uh, drawn SMEs and some sectors of the economy, the productive right economy, to corporation, the national law will have to be modified. So that means that corporations, by means of this kind of treaties, will rule over countries and populations. This is why this kind of treaty is so dangerous. They want to make important things to be discussed in um, the corporations and in arbitration courts, which are not democratically elected. So these are non-democratic methods. Housing and social exclusion. The housing bubble took place because the financial sector wanted it to happen. So the financial sector has to pay for the present situation where we have millions of empty flats. So all the floods and houses that banks own right now have to be put to the service of people who don't have a flood. And finally, in Catalonia, in Spain, uh, we are asking for a bailout. Without uh, tax reform, we won't find a solution. In order to uh, maintain the welfare state, we have to change taxation because we need resources. Uh, secondly, we need a collective bargain, a collective negotiation. And this is very important because workers, employers, they must all have a say and the workers have to have a voice so corporations and companies cannot do what they want. And thirdly, there is a part of the society that uh, don't have enough money to live, so we need a minimum. Uh, prestige accident, nuclear accidents, everything is translated. Uh, the environmental inequalities in social inequalities. This fight in the south of Europe has several components, democracy and rights. Yesterday, uh, Italian colleague said that in order to impose this new economic and social order, we have to deconstruct society, democracy. In order to change, to build a new economic and social order, we need to build democracy in a couple of days. First of all, uh, democratic regeneration, to change the political system in order to make it more participative and a constituent citizen process that the Green parties have defended for many years in Europe, and we are going to do it in Spain. Secondly, we need the parties participation, participative democracy. The citizens should be key players in decision-making process. We are building a new way of acting. We are networking. We are looking for the social majority because we should understand that all these uh, social transformation measurements, uh, the vote support is not enough, and the citizens, the parties, social movements, we have to take all this into account. Democracy, yes, but there is something which is missing here. Higher participation of women. We cannot build a democratic society in which half of the population, women, are underrepresented. Well, I become very much upset when in the left of this country, I don't see any feminine reference. We have excellent female members of parliament who are second line of their political parties. There is the old politics uh, is the one done by men. Uh, we should give more protagonism and a bigger role to women. Rights, the second field of action. Uh, rights should be the base and the aim of all policies. When we uh, talk about giving back politics to people, we are talking about politics in order to protect and guarantee the rights of people. Uh, human rights, of course, social rights, but we should also include other rights, environmental rights, 
digital rights, for example, and rights of groups which are still fighting for the rights, such as the EGTB Plus Collective. If we don't add new collectives to this fight, this is the 21st century. The fight for social justice has to evolve with society. If we talk about fighting for our rights, we have to talk about social exclusion and poverty. When somebody is at risk of social exclusion, his rights are being violated and we have a problem in the south of Europe. We are violating the human and social rights of people. Against social exclusion we have to apply three measures. First, an urgent plan to respond to the basic needs of everybody uh, who doesn't have these needs covered. Feed, feeding, education, energy, housing, but we also need active employment policies, not any employment policies. 400 euros per 10 hours a day, it's a fraud and it's a slavery. We have to create quality employment, but not in any sector. We have to try to change the productive and consumption model in order for us to be able, on the one hand, to reduce our carbon footprint to become a greener economy, but also beneficial for people, care economy, research, development, clean energies. Finally, when we talk about social policies, we should forget concepts such as help, subsidies. We want a social policy based on rights. Institutions have the duty to guarantee the basic rights of people, and these are the social policy or as a need. It's a resource when the oligarchies and the financial powers use it to become richer when they speculate. But it's a basic right and basic need for each one of uh, us. The way we plan the housing, the quality of the houses, it's in the hand of the market because of the economic benefits. And the quality of the housing uh, has consequences in the health of people. It's related to energetic poverty, energetic rehabilitation of houses. This will favor social inclusion and will reduce the social inequalities due to this electrical oligopoly. But there is the other side. 20 years ago, poor people, those socially excluded, are were the homeless. Nowadays, somebody with a home can be poor because he's not eating, he's not consuming energy in order to pay his mortgage, and they suffer eviction, and their house are taken away, etc., and they're socially excluded. When we talk about exclusion and poverty, we have to name women again. They are most affected by unemployment, especially if they're older than 45. When they reach the age of retirement, they have lower pensions. And uh, single parent families, supported by women, are the poorest. Uh, children's poverty is also related to women unemployment. If we work for women employment, we directly reduce children's poverty. More than three million children are poor in our country. Immigration, child poverty. When we talk about exclusion and violation of rights, we have to talk about migrants. Not only are we denying them the rights once they arrive here, but we are violating the rights in their countries. This is why they come here. Currently, more than 30 million people in the world are dying, and they have to move because of climate change. Environmental refugees, climate change, is the main reason for immigration in the world. This continent, this fortress continent that we are creating, more than 270,000 people uh, have penetrated the borders of the south of Europe, in the east of Europe, central Mediterranean and western Mediterranean, not counting the people who die trying to uh, reach Europe. Because yesterday night some people try to uh, reach Spain. It's happening every day, uh, violation of human rights. Uh, nobody talks about it. Uh, these are not longer news. And women don't jump the fence. Uh, women fen uh, migrate less than men because they remain in their countries. But when they try to do it, this trip is much harder because the children they bring, the pregnancies they bring, are not the result of a loving relationship, it's the result of abuses. And besides all this, we blame them. We blame them for economic crisis. And we have what we call cultural xenophobia. This is the 
trend that has gone all over Europe. We said that they want to destroy our civilization. There is no bigger enemy to us than ourselves, our productive and consumption model. As Florian was saying yesterday, the political, environmental, social care crisis that we have imposed is the result of our own contradictions. As a summary of this fight for democracy and rights is the TTIP. We all know what it is. But besides social labor rights, let me highlight a couple of important risks. Environmental rights that we've been fighting for are going to be under threat. GMOs, uh, food security, standards of protection, etc. But women are going to suffer this TTIP. In the United States, the labor legislation does not recognize equality of wages. They are not measured to reconcile family and work life. So we have a lot at stake with the TTIP. This fight for transforming the system <coughs> has to take into account environmental justice because the 21st century, the fight is going to be in the access to resources, water, energy, food, and it should include, include feminist fight. There is not bigger oppression than patriarchy. And the feminist fight is a fight uh, which is in the hands of women since they are called the left. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I thought I could let you talk for a bit longer because you've uh, dealt with the feminist question, but we don't have much time. So let me read you the list of people who are going to intervene in order to see if they're all here. And then, every time somebody talks, I will introduce them in a more specific form. Florian Ohon. And we let her read the names in French. Juan Mena Stelios Christodoulou. Stelios Christodoulou. Como? Πάντως μπορείς πέντε λεφτά αν θέλεις. Ε, ε, Χεσούς Ζούστε, Χαβιέ Τάουσο, Μαρίσα Ματίας, ε, Φελίσιτη Ντάουλινγκ, Κριστίν Μέντελσον, Βάλτερ Μπάγερ. I'm not going to call the comrades according to this order because some of them have to leave before the end of the seminar because they have flights to catch. So, it's okay. Can you listen to translation? I, sorry, I didn't translate the names because the names are the names and I leave it like them, like that. Uh, so I'm not going to follow exactly the list because I'm going to read first the colleagues who have to leave the meeting before the end of the meeting. So Florian, Luxembourg, you can start. Uh, friends and comrades, uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me to the Forum of the South, coming from the North. Um, I come from Rosa Luxemburg uh, Foundation Brussels. And coming from Brussels to the South, I come with uh, some good news and a lot of bad news, naturally. Um, I'm talking about the TTIP. Um, I've been recently in a, uh, let's start with the good news. <laughs> recently I've been in a discussion of the EU Commission about the TTIP. There was the head of strategy of uh, DG Trade and so on. And it was really amazing how infuriated these people were. They were like crying, whining about how the civil society, the trade unions, the left and green parties of Europe destroyed their plan to install the TTIP within a year without a lot of public attention. Didn't work. They got very angry about that. They were complaining, civil societies lying all the time, 
they use modern media like Twitter, which the commission obviously cannot use or something, I don't know. Well, it was really amazing that these people who always think of themselves so highly were crying so much. And this is very good news. Um, the bad news is um, this won't stop them. Because they want the TTIP and the TTIP is very dangerous. Why is it so dangerous? Um, Juan already mentioned some aspects and um, I want to come back to something that um, Yanis Miller said yesterday. Um, he said, austerity is a model of the elites to destroy our welfare uh, uh, model. And I think we have to think austerity and TTIP together because what has been implemented through austerity measures uh, in the past couple of years will be implemented forever if TTIP will be implemented in Europe and the United States. Um, because there's, uh, in my opinion, two key elements in the TTIP besides all the details about uh, environmental standards, workers' rights, and so on. And the one thing is, um, that's what Juan already mentioned, um, is the so-called investor state dispute settlement, the arbitration uh, councils, which allow uh, private companies to sue states um, uh, if they think some of their economical gains are endangered. There's a lot of these uh, cases through uh, to other contracts already around. Many of you may have heard about this. In Germany, we have a very famous case. It's called the Vattenfall case because in Germany, um, uh, there had been, after the Fukushima incident, there had been a huge uh, protest against uh, nuclear energy. So Germany decided to fade out nuclear energy and the Swedish company Vattenfall, through one of these ISDS clauses, now sues Germany for somewhat more than 3 billion euros, uh, which they think they should get because they, they lose some of their money because they own nuclear power plants in Germany. We have a lot of ISDS cases in Ecuador, um, and also Juan mentioned already um, the NAFTA agreement, lots of uh, similar cases between uh, US, Canada, and Mexico. So this is one of the key dangers of the TTIP. The other one, I think, it's, uh, it doesn't sound so dangerous. It's called regulatory cooperation. And it means that um, in all future legislation in Europe and the United States, on the national but also on the uh, uh, local level, let's say the, the, the state level in the, in the European member nations, um, all legislation has to be checked for so-called um, trade impacts. So if you, for example, decide that you want um, to have in your schools, in your, in your city or your region, only local food or like ecological something, I don't know, then it has to be checked if, it viol it, if this has trade effects, if it violates the right of other companies, maybe McDonald's or something, to sell the food to your children. Um, and this will be installed on a very early, um, um, very early in the process, um, so it opens a lot of space for lobbyists to check on all local legislations. So everything you want to do against austerity measures to change um, the, the political course will be impossible because in the beginning with uh, regulatory cooperation, they try to um, stop you through a lot of lobbying. And if you don't agree and you want to change a law to raise the minimum wage, to, to, to stop um, the cuts, then the companies who will expect trade loss will um, sue you. Okay, I need to stop. Only one, <laughs> two more things. Um, the other um, dimension of the TTIP is that it's going to be a, a, what Hillary Clinton called an economic NATO. So you have to see the geopolit uh, geopolit uh, geopolitical dimension of the TTIP because 
it is directed um, to contain the BRICS states, uh, especially China. I cannot elaborate on this because I don't have a lot of time. Um, I want to end with uh, some uh, bad news and good news again. The bad news is that uh, at the end of this year, there's going to be um, the CETA agreement in the European Parliament. It's the EU-Canada trade agreement. Um, and this contains most of the dangerous clauses uh, which are in the, in the TTIP agreement as well. Um, and if it, if it passes the, the parliament, then basically we don't have to fight against ISDS and TTIP. Um, but the good thing is um, that it's supposedly to be a mixed agreement, so all European member states have to, uh, to decide on this. And as we know, maybe during that time, we already have uh, member state governments in Greece um, who will oppose these trade agreements. So I hope, from my perspective, I can say we, I'm originally German, we cannot stop Merkel um, who brought austerity, but you can stop Merkel to bring TTIP. Thank you very much. Good morning, Carlos Seijo, Campaign Catalonia Norte TIP. And after Noet and Rosa Luxemburg, I don't have much to say. Excuse me. I'm Carlos Seijo of the Campaign Catalonia Norte TIP. And after Noet, a good introduction and complimentary of the colleague from Luxembourg, I don't have much to say. Just to tell you that we, what we are asking for in our campaign is to maintain or give priority to the basic, part of the basic principles of the European community, transparency and the principle of precaution. Transparency, as, in, as we know, all of us who know these treaties, uh, TIP, Theta, TIPSA, it's been negotiated and we are uh, doing it without the spaces to negotiate the uh, citizen participation. And since 2012 till 2014, 13, 135 meetings, 127 have been dedicated to the lobbies of the transnational companies, which are the ones uh, managing all our problems and basically they're imposing all their trade policies without taking into account the basic rules of democracy of our citizens, European and North American uh, policies. Not only in Europe, we're against the Treaty of Free Trade, but also in the States, and the experience that they have with the NAFTA agreement, Canada, United States, Mexico, in principle, 172 public companies were privatize with a loss of one million jobs. They destroy the environment, agriculture, uh, lifestyle of Mexico and the south of the United States. The experience we can have from these treaties The experience that we can get from these treaties is, for example, that Canada brought to court the government of Salvador for 3,500 million euros for an exploitation open sky of minerals and a company from the United States brought to court uh, Canada for moratorium f about fracking 3,500 million dollars. So this 3,500 million euros that this multinational received from North America and that coming from the pockets of uh, workers of Salvador. So you know who are the winners and who are the losers. And this increases the gap between rich and poor. And for example, the 14 richer people in Mexico in the last 20 years um, 
since the NAFTA exists, these people have increased their capital 640%, 46%, when in reality the per capita income of Mexico has dropped 45% as far as the established growth. Well, another important thing is that the European community, they are cheating themselves. Uh, European commissioners, the ones negotiating, they're cheating themselves because in principle they say that there was going to be a continuous growth of 1.5% based in studies done by entities in their administration boards are represented by the big banks, Bank of Santander, another banks, and for example, another company, another report in which they are based in order to work on this treaty is the Bertelsmann uh, president of the board, is the president of the board of Nestle Germany. So it's one of the companies which is negotiating this treaty. They're inside the negotiations of neutrality, basically zero. And then in the field of food and agriculture, uh, companies, North American companies, have lots of interest in introducing GMOs in Spain, in Catalonia. Uh, we know what they are, but most of Europe, Germany, and France, they don't have these genetically modified foods. Um, what they want to do is to empower and change the type of agriculture and change them by these genetically modified seeds and to introduce them in the market market livestock market with the increase of uh, animals. On the other hand, we have the world of the market of hydrocarbons, as Cañete said, uh, he wanted to make Spain the up of hydrocarbon products in order to produce, sell, and transport these products to the rest of Europe. So far, he's having his way, but we should be careful not only with the TTIP, but also with the NAFTA, because of the imminent danger of the bituminium lands of some of the states of Canada. Um, we know that they are elaborating uh, better improvement of the petrochemical, which is the most important petrochemical aspect in the south of Europe. Um, these bituminous lands, oil sand lands, are of low energetic power and they leave lots of waste and it's very difficult to deal with it. Thank you very much few minutes before this uh, panel started and I can tell you and I can assure you that the feeling and the atmosphere in Greece right now is revolutionary and I am sure that the ones of us who will be in Greece tomorrow will live unprecedented moments in history so you are all invited tomorrow it's a once in a lifetime <laughs> uh, situation um, uh, and I will start my five minutes now <laughs> This doesn't count. Um, friends and comrades, we all know the situation. We all know what we have right now. We have extreme poverty. We have people eating out, out of garbage pails. We have no uh, access to the healthcare system. We have people excluded from the school system. We have people who die because they have no electricity and need to burn whatever they have in their houses uh, in order to be heated. We have uh, people living out in the streets but I'm not sure that we all agree on what we want uh, after this, because one of the biggest problems we have to face is the dominant uh, uh, ideology and uh, what the neoliberal ideology has done to the mains, uh, to, to the minds of the people and how they are formed so far. So the main ideology, the dominant ideology says that self-fulfillment self comes through the market, it comes through consumerism, it comes through um, self-evaluation and self-protection. So one of the biggest problems we have is try to convince these people that things should be the other way around. 
And the only way to change the, this ideology is through practice. And because we need active members of society who will accept these values, who will incorporate these values and try to change what we have so far. So we, in this assembly room, we know that we want dignity. We, want, we know that we want labor conditions that do not resemble the Middle Ages. We know that we want a healthcare system and what this healthcare system is. But outside, in, in Greece, uh, we do not have this. So in, uh, in Syriza, uh, discussing these things and what could be done, uh, together with a very serious problem of democracy and participation, we agreed that solidarity networks would be one of the key um, uh, um, um, uh, ways to deal with this problem. Uh, because solidarity networks started building up in Greece uh, as soon as the crisis started. First of all, to deal with the immediate uh, problems that the people faced, uh, and that would be primarily the, the food issue. Then we had the electricity issue, the housing issue, and uh, together with the solidarity network that sprang and spread all over Greece, uh, we are trying and we have managed in, uh, um, uh, more or less to deal with, um, uh, with three issues. First of all, solidarity networks, because they are formed in such a way that people participate in them uh, in uh, equal, uh, through assemblies, there is no hierarchy uh, in, uh, in, in the, with uh, democratic assemblies. So people become real participants and decide on their own lives, decide on their own priorities. And so this fights the nuclear, the center of the dominant hegemony that has to do with the degrading uh, of politics, that politics and politicians are all corrupt, they are all the same, that nothing can change. Through the examples of the solidarity networks that uh, spring up in, in many different neighborhoods all around Greece and have to do with many different aspects of uh, social life, people have started to believe that they can be, they can become themselves the change that they want to see in the society. Um, it also, uh, solidarity networks also bring forward the values of the left, that people should work collectively, that we can change things, that no change can come to a, a human being uh, alone, but things can change and should change for everybody. And they also help people understand and, and make people understand that they are changing. There are numerous examples all around Greece. Uh, I have seen them personally and a lot of my colleagues and comrades that people's consciousness change through participation in these solidarity networks. They get together and they meet people from their neighborhoods that they had never seen before, they had never met. They realize that they share the, the same problems with the other people and they all together try to find solutions for their own problems and do not expect the solutions from anywhere from, uh, from other places. And the third thing that solidarity networks do, and I will give you one example of this, is that they change the immediate relationship between uh, action and result. And a very interesting case is the case of the medical social centers that we have in Greece and the one we have in Thessaloniki, where people got together after a very big uh, immigrant strike we had three years ago, and uh, comrades and friends got together and decided that because, and realized that because the health issue in Greece uh, would be expanding and, and become really dangerous for people, uh, and they, form, they formed this medical social center uh, in which about 200 people, at least in the level in Thessaloniki I'm talking about, in the north, participate and uh, gather medicine and um, uh, these are all both doctors and, um, and uh, people that have to do with the medical se sector. And uh, about three or 4,000 people every two months go to this social medical center and get health care. But it is not only that they address, that this medical social center addresses the immediate needs of people, it also puts forward uh, and it also organizes people and um, makes people, make makes people understand that we need a different healthcare system. So very often, uh, the members and uh, the solidarity members of the social uh, medical center in Thessaloniki, which has, has great, um, is very well reputed and does a lot of work, 
we very often visit hospitals like two or three hundred people all together and demand uh, health care for special cases that are not covered by insurance by insurance so we have people that cannot be operated because they do not health in, have health insurance and we manage to do it because all these people become active members of society uh, participating in the social health center and then we have the result that that these people I do not see what does it say one minute okay and the third thing um, uh, this uh, social medical center does is that it shows people what kind of a state health system we want a state health system that everybody will have access to that there all everybody's needs immigrants and Greeks needs will be addressed that uh, we do not need insurance in order to have this so it is three things put in one and to conclude democracy can never be enough and democracy uh, can only be understood and can only uh, take place if it is practiced it is like the bicycle and we need to create and expand public spaces where democracy is exercised neighborhood assemblies participatory uh, participatory budget uh, in terms of uh, the, the public uh, sector cultural centers cooperatives and all these and places like this where people can participate and become active members because we might have the right plan we might have the right uh, idea for society but without participation in the um, forming of this society it's very unlikely that people will will, ha will share uh, uh, the or the distribution of the wealth thank you very much four things first of all I think that we all agree that fascism is a problem throughout Europe and in other parts of the world. We cannot ignore the problem. We cannot say that, well, when we end with capitalism, we will end with fascism. No, I think this is not right. We have to fight against fascism today and in the future. After the terrible attacks in Paris, there is a tsunami of Islamophobia throughout Europe. And this is something we have to fight against strongly by showing solidarity with our brothers and sisters, Muslim brothers and sisters. And I'm going to come back to the topic. I'm going to tell you about unity against fascism, what we do, and then I'm going to make two or three remarks. Unity against fascism and racism in Catalonia was born in 2010, 2011, from the anti-war movement a movement that uh, took to the streets in 2003. With the same spirit of anti-war movement, we have a consensus point. This is fight against the extreme far right parties. Beyond this, we all have different views on Palestine, of uh, budget cuts here. What unites us is the fight against far right uh, parties. We fight against uh, racism also, but there are other movements, classical movements, fighting against racism. And we have members of all these parties as well in unity against fascism and racism. We have 400 associations that are part of unity against racism and fascism and throughout Catalonia. Since the creation of unity against fascism and racism, we have been fighting against Platform for Catalonia, which is a far-right political party in Catalonia. Since 2011, the movement, this political party, has lost uh, voters in big, uh, uh, where the party was created. Uh, they have expelled the leader of the party. So I think that what we do is pertinent. Concerning Islamophobia, in our uh, movement, we have uh, different visions on several things, but we've been talking about Islamophobia, and since last week, we've been talking with Muslim associations, and we are launching a campaign called Stop Islamophobia. This morning in Barcelona, uh, an event has taken place. Uh, um, Badalona has a racist mayor, uh, 
and a mosque and Islamic center was closed down this week, uh, and several uh, movements have um, taken to street this morning. What can I say in one minute and a half? Unity against uh, fascism in Catalonia. I think we've done a lot of work. Uh, I think several of you know about what we do. But at a European le level, I think more movements like ours are needed. Because I think in many countries, there are not unity movements. Because political parties have to do their work. But that's not enough. We need broader movement in order to stop fascists. As uh, we have proven it's possible in the UK or here in Catalonia. We should organize in European networks. And these networks cannot be led by political parties because political parties have their own functions. I think these movements have been led by uh, social uh, movements, not by NGOs either. And it has to be based on practical actions. I we are going to organize a whole day against Islamophobia, against racism on the 21st of March, which is the International Day Against Racism. And this year, we have to make a unity call against Islamophobia and in solidarity with our brothers and sisters who are Muslims. In the 30s, Nazi attacked Jews. And today, we cannot uh, keep our mouth shut. We have to stop Islamophobia because first it's our Muslims and then will be uh, communists and then other people. And we, when we wake up, it will be too late. So we have to stop racism and Islamophobia right today from now on. To speak in this city of struggle with Barcelona with such a huge history, which resonates again in England. I've come to speak asking for help in campaigns that we are involved in. And particularly, we're looking at the use of anti-migrant sentiment in, by the government to try and dr drum up an excuse for austerity, an excuse for welfare states, for cuts on the welfare state. It's a vile and destructive ideology but unthinking people can easily blame on their first thought the problems they face on the migrant. And we have to counter it. The neoliberal project has constructed financial and economic centers that draw in workers. All the economic papers write this and explain this, but to the, the way the popular press put it forward, the way our government puts it forward, it's an individual and a miscreant decision, an evil decision for people to move looking for work. In addition to the financial and economic pressures that pull migrants towards Britain and other major economic centers, there are the wars and the terrible destruction that's going on, in particular the tragedy of Syria, which is forcing a huge human migration across continents. And we know that the crossing of the Med, the crossing of the Mediterranean, is a huge center for this problem. And our government has chosen to use the idea that crossing the Mediterranean is something that should be discouraged and discouraged by drowning. They want people to drown. They want to withdraw search and rescue from the MED and make it to be an, a European policy to withdraw search and rescue. More than 3,000 people drowned, mainly from unregulated transport, last year. We cannot tolerate this. As migrants settle in Britain and migrants organize in Britain, we need to be with them in their organization in demanding the respect of human rights for each person. And to say to our people, Maria, as our first speaker earlier on mentioned, the need of political parties to provide an alternative story, an alternative description of the problems we face. Our alternative description across Europe must explain that the needs of the migrant are the needs of the settled people. 
an alternative construction, not the neoliberal construction, will hopefully leave the periphery with the attempt to grow economically and provide jobs for their own people where they, where they work, where they live. But we are asking that we can have, through links across Europe, that we can have some joint action, a joint week, a joint day, where we can say together that we are not prepared to see drowning as border control, that we will want the respect for human beings in their movements across the world and in the right to economic growth wherever they are. Our green speaker mentioned the fact that one of the driving forces of migration is climate change, and that will not change until the way we organize our society changes. We need to explain these things to all our people, but our voice will be stronger, far, far stronger, if it's not one small party in, in England and Wales making this case, but one which is Europe-wide, that the needs of the migrant are the needs of the worker, and the European worker cannot be safe if they allow themselves to be split from the workers forced to migrate. We stand together as workers, we stand together looking for a far better future, and one we hope the uh, Sunday's election will, will kickstart. Thank you for listening to me. Good morning. Thank you, first of all, for having invited the Commission for the uh, Guaranteed Income. I think we have a broad agreement on the fact that adjustment and austerity policies have created or inflicted a lot of pain in the societies, particularly in the south of Europe, poverty um, because of the high unemployment. The guaranteed income for citizens is an emergency solution. We, need, we know that we need other measures, but this is one emergency solution. And in the um, Constitution of Catalonia, we have this article, and it was passed on in 2006. However, it hasn't been implemented. And thanks to this initiative, we have started the debate in the Catalan Parliament. Sadly, and I would like to mention here right now what I'm going to say. I would like to say that the mass government says that uh, it's the champion uh, in the fight of inequalities and social issues when the social rights European Commission has said that Catalonia and the Catalan government is not fulfilling the social rights charter concerning minimum income because it doesn't guarantee its implementation. And this government, the Catalan government, which is a conservative government, is putting off the implementation of the law. It was presented in the parliament on the 26th of March, and only 21 out of 80 uh, members that have to speak in the parliament have spoken. So, and you know that we will have elections in September. So, the first thing I'm telling you is that the Commission is going to promote a forum of alternative to unemployment and poverty, which is going to take place from the 10th to the 12th of April, where we are going to present some um, alternatives. And we are going to demand the Catalan government to do everything they can in order to pass the law before the end of the term. Yesterday, I was thinking about what has happened, and I was trying to talk to some MPs. I've talked to Urtasun and to Javier Couso because I was fearing that we had a Dignity Week in June last year, and we put forward a letter 
which was presented to the European uh, Parliament Office here in, Catal in Catalonia. It was a letter addressed to the European Central Bank, the Com European Commission, Commission and the European Parliament. And we found out that they didn't receive the letter. So what I've done is to give the letter to European MPs personally so they can take action. And I'm going to read the proposals that we included in the letter. We said we are aware that the policies and the decisions affect the life of citizens of all European members. We ask for a debate at a European level in order to provide an answer to the following issues. Establish as a subjective right for all European citizens an income guaranteeing enough income so that any family is excluded or is under the threshold of the poverty in Catalonia, in, 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 in Europe. In Catalonia, we have to establish a harmonized uh, indicator concerning poverty. In order to finance this guarantee income, we propose to create a, social, a European social fund that big fortunes, banks, and corporations are going to contribute, as well as surplus states or surplus governments. The European Central Bank has to lend credit at zero interest rate to public governments, such as the Catalan government, which has uh, competencies in social policies in order to finance the cost without having to pay back interests to banks or intermediate institutions. We wait for your answer, and we are willing to debate about this in the forum you propose. Ernest Urtason was telling me that they are working in that direction and that we will be offered to meet with European MPs that can um, move forward this proposal. And I think that if uh, this uh, we can bridge this, we have to be uh, we can congratulate ourselves. I think there is money to fight against poverty because Intermon Oxfam has provided some data which are frightening. One percent of the richest people in Europe have as many money as seventy percent of the most poor people, and one percent of the world richest people have the same amount as ninety-nine percent of the rest of world population. There is enough money to finance the initiatives that will uh, help us to fight against poverty. And to end in a more positive uh, note, I would like to say that tomorrow in Greece, our colleagues are going to win. And hope is something possible for all of us. And we have to be with them because we are fully aware that we are going, you are going to be under pressure uh, from Monday onwards. But you can count with our support. Thank you. By power, economic power, and financial power, and the impact of this kidnapping can be felt, especially in educational policies and also in the university field. Uh, people talk in the south of Europe about different models of education. For example, in Catalonia, they talk about Nordic countries as an educational successful model. But when they start this debate, when we think about this alternative, they always hide data which are also very important and we have to take into account in order to analyze why uh, policies are somehow different, or educational policies, to what we have in the south of Europe. The first important data is the percentage of public schools in the south of Europe and the percentage of public schools in Nordic countries. The average of Nordic countries reaches 98% of public schools, practically the totality of uh, public schools in which schools are public. In the countries of the south of Europe, Catalonia, the percentage is 60% of public schools, 40% of private or concerted schools. 
and this is a data that they always try to hide. Second, investment, education investment if every country, every state in educational policies. The average of the European Union is 6.2 percent. In the countries of the South, the average is 3 percent. Therefore, half of the public investment is for education in these countries. And we defend education as a tool for the fight for the equality of opportunities. So each of us should be equal independently of the weight of the pockets of our families, the fight for social cohesion. Public school has to be an element of social cohesion and the fight for social justice in our countries. But what they are doing, neoliberal governments with the complicity of social democracy. They have abandoned the defense of public services. And what they are doing is an education which is becoming more and more mercantile, that is to say, on the needs of the interest of the markets. The markets are the ones defining what professional careers should students follow in the countries of the south of Europe, an education which is purely based on scientific basis, abandoning the humanistic challenges, which are the ones which should conform the critical perspective of the citizens, a precarious education. Nowadays, the group of professors and teachers and the rest of educators in our schools um, all over the countries of the south of Europe and in the process of precarious uh, process. Uh, colleagues from Greece, Portugal, uh, colleagues from the Spanish state and Catalonia, and we are in a situation of labor precarity uh, with the cuts of our rights because they know if they reduce the rights of the workers of education, they are reducing also the quality uh, of our public schools. An important element also to take into account is the process of expulsion of uh, participation of internal democracy in all the educational centers. They won educational centers where they could not participate. And against this, we have to stand up. What is the education, the educational alternative? that we have to defend from the transforming left. First of all, a public education. That means that education should not be the business of anybody. With the rights of the students, people should not defend their economic interest. And it has to be also uh, non-religious education. Religion has to stay in the church and education has to stay in the school, because this is also the shared problem by many of the countries of the south of Europe when we talk about economic and religious interest in schools and education. It has to be uh, co-educational education. It cannot be any other way. Equality among men and women, equality among those who understand sexuality in a certain way and those who understand sexuality somehow differently starts in the classroom of our public schools. So a co-educational training, education should be the alternative model we defend from the transforming left. And finally, of course, it has to be uh, participative education. Educational policies should count with the participation, on the participation of everybody, educational community, of the environment, the families, neighbors of every educational center. Therefore, we need almost a democratic revolution inside the schools in order to turn around the situation and to turn around the educational process uh, defended by neoliberal governments. Let me conclude with a sentence said by the feminist pedagogist uh, Maria Montessori. She said that the first task of education is to agitate life in order to live it free so it can be developed. So the first aim that we have is to agitate the student's life, but then to set it free so that this life can be developed under 100% guarantee. So, in summary, the big challenge we are facing is the challenge of agitating Europe. And the big challenge we are facing is the one of agitating education, because only by moving Europe and 
question in education, we will achieve the development of citizens and peoples free in the south of Europe. Thank you, and let's hope this is a very fruitful meeting. They denounce what is called the poverty of some people, allowing the distribution of dividends and also the dismissal of those who have produced these dividends. The drama of Charlie Hebdo and the reaction caused in France and the world is asking us about the world order. All over the world there are citizens who have met around the slogan, I am Charlie, in order to express the freedom of equality and fraternity in front of these exclusion policies in our neighborhoods, the aggressive policies of the Western world in order to impose their hegemony all over the world, especially in the Arab world. The big transatlantic market is a very dangerous phase that we have to fight against, and also the free trade of the Euro-Mediterranean alliance. What is at stake in our societies are not only the immigrants coming to look for a job, but shareholders without frontiers looking for uh, non-decent benefits. We should not allow the market, we should not leave in the hands of the market the task to regulate the problem of injustice and inequality. We should decrease the power of banks, multinational companies, international companies, because collective security goes through the cooperation of sovereign peoples. And we have to say yes to the working class fight. Calimera, this weekend we are all Greek. So we just need to say Calimera. Let me bring some greetings from Aragon. I'm Terzo Giuste, a member of the Aragon Parliament, which is an old nation of Europe with 1,000 years of history and resist to disappear in the uniformity of this globalized world. And we have a big European uh, vocation. We are always looking towards the Pyrenees. One of the most repetitive debates in Aragon is trans-frontier debates. For the last 25 years, the rail line of Can Frank is closed, the line uniting the territories and the communities of the hinterland of Spain with the heart of Europe. 45 years waiting, and this claim has become a sign of identity of the people of Aragon. This is why when they say that Europe is the place of the free circulation of people, goods, and capitals. Well, capitals, we all know that it's true. But of course, the free circulation of people, we know this is not true in the Gibraltar Strait, Sicilia, and also, of course, in those bottlenecks in the transfrontier communication, such as the case of Aragon and the Pyrenees. This is not the European Union they promised. The founding fathers wanted to build a new Prometeo, and that became a monster like the one of Dr. Frankenstein. A monster with a deformed head, just half a brain, and is lacking the half political brain, the feminine brain, and it has just a half um, brain. The only thing it has is a till. As brain. It has the wallet full of notes and dollars, more than euros. And this deformed monster with very small arms, because these are the social arms, the arms of labor rights, the arms of the rights of workers are becoming smaller and smaller without legs, legs which should help us and contribute towards progress. Legs of the citizens are becoming smaller and smaller. This is the Europe that we have. This is the Europe that we have built. They have built on our behalf, but without us. And against this Europe, we citizens should stand up. This is the Europe serving the interests of capitalism, but we are penetrating a feudal capitalism. This is a Europe which is built according to the neoliberal dogma, a Europe built, given its back to people. I'm not surprised that the European citizenship gives its back to the European Union. I'm not surprised. This is what they deserve. 
and this Frankenstein monster, which is the European Union, doesn't have a soul because the soul of Europe is the culture of its peoples and the culture of the people of Europe is forgotten, is marginalized in minority. And this is why we have the Europe of the Troika and not the Europe of the citizens. We should remember yesterday our friend Cayo Lara was shown the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, a ridiculous paper, small, very, very tiny, which could fit in a very small space. We don't want a mini charter of mini rights. We want a mega charter of mega rights, because this is why uh, past generations have been fighting for more than 150 years. So Europe becomes a synonym of freedom, progress, and democracy. Right now, Europe is covered by the boards of big multinationals. And this is why this is not the European Union that we wanted. This is not the European Union that we won. But we are not alone in this fight in the south of Europe. Many of the things that were mentioned yesterday and have been mentioned today can be applied to some of the countries of the north that are suffering austerity and austericide, like um, suicide caused by austerity. And this is what we are suffering here in Europe. Countries of the north of Europe which have been rescued um, where the surveys are forecasting a possible victory of the left in uh, some future elections. I think that the Irish either are the Mediterranean of the north, they deserve to be here in the second forum of the south of Europe. And to conclude, all together we have duty to change the Europe that we have received. We have the need to do it. Our people are requesting us to do it. Citizens cannot resist any longer. They cannot withstand more sacrifices. Uh, citizens are asking us to change Europe. They are asking us to against Angela Merkel, Mario Gravi, in order to live in dignity, in order to build a new the Europe of the citizens and the Europe of people. Citizens, comrades, we do not longer want the Europe of merchants. We want the Europe of the citizens who have the right to decide their everything and let me conclude uh, it's fundamental to build the Europe of democracy because this debate this weekend's debate nothing else is going to happen it talks about democracy let us decide everything and if we the people decide freely decide like tomorrow in Greece we should recuperate sovereignty, we have to recuperate social and political rights, the Europe of living together, no matter where they come from, what they speak, the faith, confessional, they have to live together, and we also have to live together. And other human beings, the animals, who are also uh, sensible beings, of protection and they also belong to our society tomorrow. The change in the European Union will start. It's not going to be easy. See, it's again not do it alone. We know that the mafia is going to go after the government of Alexis Tsipras. It's going to make them in big difficulties, but you count with our support, with all the countries left European parties. So thank you very much. Um, in order to be short, I want to give only two ideas. One idea is I uh, really appreciated yesterday's speeches, in particular the ideas put forward regarding stop austerity, uh, fair European settlement for the crisis and European New Deal. In the essence, this means that what we are want to live is 
not doing away with national democracy and national sovereignty, but adding to it European democracy and European uh, sovereignty. And the proof of all this will be when we have a left government in Greece, which tables its demands. They will not be something which concerns only the Greek government and the European institutions. This will be European issues. The second idea which I leave, uh, want to give to you is um, 2015 will be a crucial year for the European left and for the European people. We will see 10 national elections, 10 parliaments be, be elected. Um, this concerns a third of the European electorate. According to uh, recent polls, the radical left parties will acquire or could acquire in these elections 13%, 7% in the last elections. If this actually takes place, it would of course be a shift in the relation of power and it would be important and it would be the first step through the door which the Syriza government opened to us. And having said this to you, I just want to finish up by saying we all are Greeks, of course we are. We are fascinated by that what is uh, now happening in this uh, country of the South. I share the idea that the South in Europe is now the hope for Europe. Let's go to this, through this door, let's do it with passion and let's do it passionate. And Definitely, we have the possibility to win, and we should use this possibility. Thank you. I have written a speech for four minutes. I don't know if it's going to be possible to say everything in a couple of minutes, but we are trained to use one minute only. I would like to reflect on the questions of defense and peace. We are affected by those. We were saying that authoritarian federalism uh, for political powers is what dominates the neoliberal European Union. But I also wanted to insist on this geopolitical control uh, by the United States and big international companies through the NATO. The NATO has been here for a long time, but which have to be refounded when the Soviet enemy fell down. And they refounded themselves saying that they have uh, NATO with a European pillar. The unification of Germany, reunification uh, was done under uh, using this pillar. This NATO wants to have an axis in order to act outside the framework of the UN with a global framework pointing to a series of aims which should worry us, water migration resources. But when the United States changed the strategic axis towards Asia and the Pacific, it gives us the countries of the South and Europe uh, protagonism in the contention of Russia. Take a look at the North and the South of the Mediterranean. The North controlling the Euro-Asian axis and the South Maghreb and Africa in this battle against China for natural resources. What I wanted to say is this idea that the need of uh, helping and um, we need a cold defense frame in the framework of peace outside this militarist bloc, which leads us to war and extinction, which is the NATO. So let me launch this idea in other forms, in other ideas. Let's think about the way to achieve a regional bloc of the South working for peace outside these military blocs, which is the NATO. I'm the last one, so very briefly, good morning to all of you. I'm going to talk about transatlantic treaty. I think that we all share the solutions and the view. The thing is to know how after so many defeats, we can turn them into a victory because uh, several proposals have been refused. We have two trade union movement political parties against these uh, treaties. So we have to stand together in order to oppose financial markets. 
We have to claim back democracy. This is the problem we have today. But if we share the vision, if we share the answers, we have to know how to proceed. And I think that unity of uh, political parties, of the European left party and other movements and parties is very important because it's a step forward in order to avoid further defeats. We are a lot of people involved. We are, we have one year, nearly one year until the climate change summit in December 2015 in Paris. And I would like to say that there are many people on the ground with whom we can make things. There is a petition set up by our colleagues from the Communist French Party. I think uh, it's going to be mentioned. And I would like to say that for the climate change, we have to stand together, all together, in order to have a strong proposal and to tell world leaders that not Alexis won't be alone, but all uh, the people in Europe and the movements that are taking to the streets. Thank you.